In this video, I'm going to be talking about this little power supply that I put together. This is based around one of these little modules that you can pick up online. Uh, this is one of the higher powered ones, so it actually has a separate uh, sort of controller. And then if you look in the back here, we have the circuit board that the controller is, well, controlling. So that's the actual converter in there, and then the this is basically just the controller for it. Anyway, this is in a 3D printed case, obviously, and I'm going to go ahead and put this model up on Thingiverse so other people can print it if they choose to do so. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the design of this, and I've got some footage of me putting it together. Uh, so first off, the circuit board is actually uh, glued in here uh, just to keep it from flopping around, really. It fits in there fairly well, but I didn't want it flopping around, so it's just got a bit of glue in the corners holding it in. I've got these vents in the back because if you look in there, it actually does have a fan on that uh, heat sink. So I figured that'd probably be a good idea to not have that enclosed. And I'm using an XT60 connector on the input here, which the holes for my XT60 connector turned out a little bit too big, but I still got it glued in there. Pretty ugly glue job, but it'll work. On the front of this thing, we've got another XT60 connector. Uh, this is for the output. And then I've got a couple of binding posts here, which also have the banana jacks on them. And these are spaced properly, so you can plug in a standard uh, banana jack type cable there. And then we've got the actual controller itself. So I'll go ahead and plug in the power to the back of this thing. Uh, I'm using XT60 connectors because I've got a bunch of things that already have XT60 connectors on them. So like batteries and things like that that I can power this from. This is, like I mentioned, a fairly powerful uh, supply here, so I'll go ahead and grab the spec sheet for it, actually. All right, so I'll go ahead and move this out of the way for the moment, and we'll take a look at this. Uh, this is just the paper that they gave me with the power supply, so this one's from Drock. I think the cost on this one was something like 50 bucks, so this is probably one of the more expensive ones that you can find, though it's also one of the more high power ones that you can find. And it's actually a pretty impressive little module from what I've seen so far. Uh, extremely accurate with voltage and current, so I was pretty impressed with the little thing. But anyway, the input voltage range is anywhere from 6 up to 40 volts, and the output range is 0 to 32 volts. And your output current is 0 to 5 amps. And the output power is 0 to 160 watts because of that. And it will, I've noticed, you can actually set it up at 5.1 amps output, so you get a little bit more power than what it's uh, technically rated for. And you have these, uh, the resolutions and everything here, you can see that. One of the nice things about this particular module is that it's actually a buck boost converter. So this will allow me to take any voltage within this range and output any voltage within this range. So right now, I'm inputting 24 volts into it and it will allow me to output anywhere from the zero to 32 volts. You're not limited to only going down with the voltage or only going up with the voltage. You can go either way with it. So that's fairly nice. Uh, this power supply, like I mentioned, the thing's actually extremely accurate. Uh, you can change quite a few settings with it as well. Uh, the most basic ones, if you click on the, uh, the V button here, it'll allow you to adjust the voltage in hundreds of a volt, or if you push this knob in, it'll let you change it to tenth of a volt or one volt increments, and then you just twist the knob, of course, to set your voltage, or you can hit the A button down here, and you can change your current in one milliamp steps, 10 milliamp steps, 100 milliamp steps, or one amp steps. So that's how that works. You can actually change quite a few more parameters here if you hit the set button. The first one is V set and I set. That's the exact same as what you can set with the V and A uh, buttons on the other screen. And you also notice it's still displaying the output voltage and current up on top, which is kind of nice. Uh, so V set, I set. The next one is over voltage protection, over current protection, and over power protection. Uh, BLED is the backlight of the screen, so backlight brightness. Uh, M pre is actually like presets. I think it gives you 10 presets where you can save all this stuff and be able to load them back, which is kind of nice. And then S initialize or whatever that's supposed to stand for is uh, whether or not when you first connect the power to this power supply, if the output is on or off. So that's what that is. 
You can also lock the keypad, so if I turn the output on and I hold down the rotary encoder for more than two seconds, you'll see that lock icon changes and now I won't be able to change anything. Everything just kind of locks out until you hold it down for two seconds again and you'll see that lock icon go back to the unlock symbol. Uh, we have this thing down here, CV, that'll change to CC, so that's constant voltage or constant current. The power light down here is green when the output's on and it's red when the output is off. And the check mark is for the overcurrent protections and over voltage protections and the overpower protection, I suppose, that are in this screen. You notice it also shows the VN uh, voltage down here. So that's right now is 24.1. That's just what's coming in from the power supply. That's useful if you're gonna run this off of uh, batteries or something like that. Now, when I designed this, I decided I'd go ahead and put it at a bit of an angle. So you can kind of see that there. The uh, screen's actually angled back a little bit, not a whole lot. I didn't want to make the thing impossible to print, but you know, anyway, that just makes it a little bit easier to adjust it and be able to see it as it's sitting on the desk. But I'm actually pretty surprised with the uh, viewing angles on that screen. You can pretty much see it from any angle. So that's fairly nice. I think that is an OLED screen. Assembling this thing isn't too bad, about the hardest part of it, at least when I did it. I went ahead and just glued in the XT60 connectors first, and then when I went to actually put the circuit board down in there, and it was kind of a tight squeeze getting it past both of the connectors, but it wasn't too bad, it wasn't impossible for sure. And then after that, you know, I was just screwing binding post in and things like that. Fairly easy assembly, not a whole heck of a lot to it. I mean, the module itself is just plug and play, basically, and then it's got screw terminals that uh, you actually connect all the wires to and whatnot. So that's all fairly simple to uh, assemble. So it's pretty easy to assemble something like this. It is a fairly long 3D print, and I actually managed to do it twice. The reason why I did this twice is because the first one I did it in uh, ABS plastic, mostly just because I'm trying to get rid of my ABS stockpile because it's so large right now. Uh, when I originally got into 3D printing, I got a bunch of ABS plastic. Should have probably got PLA, which is a lot easier to print with, and it uh, just works a lot better on the uh, non-closed-in machines. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because if you notice, some big old cracks in this thing just because the ABS likes to shrink as it prints or as it cools off, I suppose. And this thing also broke off the... Uh, some of the support, or so, sorry, some of the vents as it was printing, which is kind of unfortunate. Also, the XT60 connector holes were too small on this. So I actually enlarged those XT60 holes a decent bit on this one, and now they're way too large, but uh, I guess that allows for some tolerance. Also, the hole on this part uh, was too big to properly fit this. The hole on here is actually about the perfect size for the uh, little module there. But anyhow, other than that, this print came out okay, except for all the cracks in it. Uh, so I redid it with uh, PLA, and it's uh, quite a bit nicer. No giant cracks in the side of it or anything like that. Print actually came out really nice. I was kind of surprised that these all worked basically flawlessly. But anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and show you the 3D files for this and kind of show you how I printed it. All right, so over here at the computer, I'll go ahead and drag the two files onto here, and you'll notice that they show up really, really small. And that is kind of a weird thing with the STLs at Fusion 360 exports and Repetier hosts. They just don't, uh, they don't really like each other for some reason, but uh, the way to fix this is to scale the object up by 25.4. And the reason why it's 25.4 is because that's the conversion factor between millimeters and inches. So for some reason it seems like Fusion is exporting millimeters files as inches files or something weird like that. But uh, you need to do that to both of them, of course. Your software may not actually uh, do this, by the way. It might just be Fusion or uh, Repetier Host in my case. but. Anyway, if they import really small, scale them up by 25.4. Go ahead and rotate these objects so they're actually sitting flat as well. And 
and I'm gonna just turn them so that they were the same way that they were when I printed them. Oops, not like that. And then I just set them both up on the build plate, something like that. So nothing real special to it. And in the slicer settings here, I did I, I basically print everything at 0 0.2 millimeters. 15% uh, infill, uh, like I said, PLA. I enabled cooling, not that it really mattered. And I have the support from the build plate only enabled. So support from build plate, you see right there. And if we slice this just to show what it looks like, give it a minute here. And there we go, roughly an 11 hour print there with roughly 50 meters worth of plastic. You can see the support structures there. Fortunately, it does put a support underneath this as well, which isn't really necessary, I don't think, but it's there and it doesn't really hurt anything. It's not that much plastic. But you got the support tower there just in case the machine doesn't quite make that bridge fully. So after that, this is pretty much ready to print. All right, so I will make the file for Fusion 360 available as well, just in case you want to change this so it doesn't have like XT60 connectors, or if you you know just use your own connectors, or just make this a normal hole at the back so you can run wires out of it, or whatever you want to do uh, to modify this. But anyway, in this file I do have stuff at least somewhat labeled. When I originally drew this, I put a rough mock-up of what the circuit board would look like and what the control module would look like in this, so that's what those two things are for. Uh, like I said, really rough mock-ups of what those are like, uh, and really the controller is not even at the same spot, that it, or not in the right spot compared to where it should be because I modified that hole at one point, but uh, anyhow, that's how that stuff is set up. And you've got the two parts right there, which you can modify and do whatever you want to. So I'll go ahead and upload this to Thingiverse as well. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this little video. Uh, if you like the project, I will put a link to the Thingiverse page to this. And then you can make this yourself if you have one of those power supply modules. Or if you want to get one of those power supply modules. I'll see if I can find that again. Uh, link to that on Amazon if I can find it. Uh, anyway, that's about it for now guys. Bye.